Uh, good evening. My name is John Haynes. On behalf of the Executive Committee of the Friends of the Institute, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Friends Forum and to introduce our speaker, uh, Kim Lane Shepley. Dr. Shepley received her A.B. from Barnard College and went on to earn Master's and Ph.D. degrees from the University of Chicago. She began her career at Bucknell University as an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology. In 1984, she moved to the University of Michigan, where she first taught sociology and then political science. When she left Michigan in 1996, she was Arthur F. Uh, Tourneau Associate Professor of Political Science and Public Policy and Faculty Associate, Center for Russian and East European Studies. From 1996 to 2005, Dr. Shevely served on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania as a professor in political science, sociology, and law. She continues her association as a faculty fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. In 2005, she was appointed Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor of Sociology and International Affairs at Woodrow Wilson School and the Center for Human Values at Princeton University, where she's also director of the program in law and public affairs. Widely published, Dr. Shevely is a recipient of numerous awards and grants, as well as many distinguished lectureships and fellowships, which we were to list, we'd be here for a long time. She holds a joint membership in the Schools of Historical Studies and Social Science at the Institute this year. Her current research is focused on the debate over the Holy Crown of St. Stephen, the 20th century interwar irredentist symbol uh, foreground in Hungary's new nationalist constitution of 2012. This evening, she will use recent developments in Hungary to consider the moral challenge to Europe. Please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Dr. Kim Lane Shapley. Thank you. <laughs> That's a, uh, great. Uh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And I, I want to say that uh, the only thing that I actually like about not having spring yet is that once spring comes, all of us who are members here realize that our time here is limited. As long as the weather is cold, we can actually live under the illusion that we're actually here for a long time. Um, being at the Institute this year has been nothing short of being in paradise, but I'm afraid I'm going to talk to you tonight about a slightly depressing topic, um, which is what is actually happening in Europe and whether Europe can actually respond to many of the crises um, that it is currently faced with. Um, I have slides. If you can't see them or I, I should be able to see them from where you are, I will not read slides, um, but mostly these are pictures. Um, I'm going to talk, when I talk about the moral challenge to Europe, uh, what I mean is the challenge to the European Union in particular. Um, and the European Union um, is a club, or at least it thinks of itself as a club of constitutional, democratic, rule of law respecting, human rights protecting countries that share a common market and that are bound by treaties. This is their self-image. Um, the dilemma is, of course, that they've actually changed a lot over the years and they haven't all caught up to the changes. The European Union started, of course, uh, as having as its aspiration a common market, um, establishing the free movement of goods, capital, p uh, services, and people, by the way, when they say services, what they mean is the ability to establish businesses, uh, primarily in different parts of the EU. But most of the EU's infrastructure was set up around building a common market. And the vast majority of law in the European Union is really set up around maintaining and structuring this market. As the European Union succeeded beyond its wildest dreams, and here it says 20 years of the single market because in 1992 they declared it done, <laughs> and so they've been resting on their laurels or they've been thinking about other things to do. The EU transformed itself from this common market, from mostly a common market, to something that we actually might now call a community of values. And what are the values? Well, the Treaty of the European Union, which is the fundamental organizing document of the European Union, gives us a list of what those values are. And it says, the European Union is founded on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. Okay? And even though the Union is founded on that, it says also that these values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity, and equality between women and men prevail. So it's a very long list of values. At the time that the EU was moving from being primarily building a common market to being a community that was going to represent these values, the EU was changing immensely. So of course, the first thing that happens is that the European Union, while it was making these transitions, also just expanded physically. 
Um, it started with, of course, six states in 1957. It expanded gradually for a while. The huge so-called Big Bang accession or Big Bang explosion of countries came in 2004 when the European Union went from 15 states to 25 overnight by adopting many states that, uh, in the region that we used to call Eastern Europe. Um, since that time, Bulgaria and Romania have signed on, and the very last country that just signed on last year was Croatia, which is there with a question mark, but now it's in. Um, it's really expanded very, very quickly while it's been also expanding its aspirations for what it can do. Um, at the same time, the European Union was also expanding in the substantive areas that it could deal with, right? So it starts with a with common market. It starts with a lot of laws about the organization of, of a common market across all of these member states. Um, and that common market law, all the law that sets that up, was always known, well, this is what I call here old Europe is the 1990s, because things change really fast in the European Union. By the 1990s, there was this sense that the law of the common market was what came to be called the first pillar of European Union law. This is a very dense, thousands, hundreds of thousands of pages of law. Now, on this particular question, this is what the EU was specializing in. But the thought was that the European Union should also now think about moving into new areas. Uh, and the two areas that were represented in this kind of expansion in the 1990s, the metaphor was always the metaphor of pillars. Um, the two additional pillars, in addition to this first pillar of EU law, common market law, was first of all this thought that if the European Union was going to be a common market, it, then it might need to also have a kind of common foreign policy because it was acting as one within, and so it needed to act as one without. And so the thought was maybe they should start thinking about moving and expanding in this particular area of common foreign and security policy. There was also a sense that you couldn't really maintain the common market by itself unless you also started thinking about the interrelationship among the judiciaries of the member states. Because if you brought a lawsuit in Germany for, again, violation of the contract, could you get the judgment in Germany enforced in England? You know, if you had a consumer protection problem in one state, could you get a remedy in another and so forth? So the idea was also that this common market was going to need to expand to what was called the field of justice and home affairs. So this, for a while, the structure of the three pillars was the way that European law organized itself. And the reason why they had to be kept separate was because in all the areas in the first pillar, common market, the idea was that the treaties had actually given to the European Union as, a, as an entity the power to make law on its own that would be binding on all of the states. But in the other two areas, security policy, foreign and security policy, and also justice and home affairs, the member states were not completely willing to give up their claim to policy making. So in the second and third pillars, the idea was that, that the European Union would share responsibilities with the member states. Well, when the, by the time that the EU did the Big Bang expansion in 2004, uh, it became really unworkable to keep the structure, in part because when you had 25 and then 27 and now 28 member states, you needed unanimity under the old rules. You couldn't do anything in the second and third pillars without having every single state sign on. And the more states you had, the more difficult that was. So the, so the Treaty of Lisbon, which came into effect in 2009, abolished the pillar structure and said, OK, now we're just going to have all EU law in all of these fields, except for the fact that member states were still really not willing to give up their powers, but at least what was sort of clawed loose was the idea that there didn't have to be unanimity among the member states in order to proceed with policy in these particular areas. Um, now, at the same time also, what you know is that those of you who have worked in Europe, and I know quite a few of you in the audience, there were some countries that wanted to charge ahead and do even more things and other countries that were unwilling to do that. So what you start finding is what came to be called two-track Europe, in which there would be some independent agreements. The, the two that probably you're most familiar with are Schengen, which is the travel agreement. It's why you only have to show a passport once when you enter any of the countries that are either, I guess there, they're in black and red. On my screen, they're in maroon and pink. Um, but so anyway, any of those countries in colors um, are countries that are part of the Schengen Agreement. And what was interesting is that there are three countries that are not members of the EU, namely Switzerland, Norway, and Iceland, that are part of Schengen, and countries that are in the EU, like Ireland uh, and the UK, which are not part of Schengen. So essentially what started happening around the edges of Europe were these alternative agreements. The Eurozone is another. It includes some of the EU member states, but not others. Now, 
Why am I telling you all of this? Well, I'm telling you all of this because you can't understand the moral crisis part until you understand how complicated the beast Europe is and how it was built in a kind of jerry-rigged fashion, you know, one sort of crisis after another or one set of aspirations after another. And there was never really an integrated structure of how all the different areas that the EU was going to act in, how they would all be all, all set up. So what you have is a set of institutional competencies in the EU that makes it very hard actually for the EU to act very efficiently when it gets a new problem. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about the new problem, but let me just say something about the structures. Um, normally when you set about trying to explain how a government, how a government is organized, you know, the standard civics view is you have the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, but the EU is not organized like that. Instead, the EU has in some ways two different executives. It's got the European Commission, which is the executive branch in some sense for all of the, what we used to call the first pillar stuff, all of the EU law, common market, anything that is the EU, that the EU can do on its own. The Commission is the executive branch for that stuff. In the meantime, all the stuff where the member states are still wanting to hold, like a co-decision, they want, they want responsibility with the EU. They don't want to just give all the power up to the EU. The executive for all of those issues is the Council of the EU. And the Council of the EU has in it all the member states of the EU will have their representatives there. So there are actually 28 members of the Commission, one from each state, but once they get to the Commission, they're supposed to act like Europeans and not like whatever country they're from. Doesn't always happen, but that's the aspiration. And then there are 28 members of the Council of the EU, one from each member state, who are there to represent the member state. So there's sort of two different executives. Um, that causes some interesting issues, which we'll see. Um, there also is in Europe a European Parliament, which for a long time was not much, which is to say that it was elected, but it had very few powers. Um, under this Treaty of Lisbon that I just mentioned, the European Parliament suddenly has a lot more powers. So it still doesn't have the power to generate legislation, but it has the power to amend legislation that's coming from one of the executives, and it has some other powers to block things. So the European Parliament's getting more powerful. And then the European Court of Justice is the court that by and large handles EU law only matters and the, EU, the European Court of Justice will come up later in our study, um, in our talk today. The reason for sort of telling you all this basic civic stuff is that all of these bodies have a kind of independent existence and they all have powers to block all of the others. Uh, and so it's not an easy matter when you want to say the EU should do something you have to first decide which institution has the power to do it, and then what about all the others? Because it's not a very orderly process. So what happens when this cumbersome beast, <laughs> which has grown over time, it's grown in size, it's grown in, in topics, it's got some, some joint responsibilities between the EU and the member states, some things the EU can do on its own. What happens when it hits crises? Well, we've all watched the EU lumber through the Euro crisis. And this map, actually, the states in yellow show you the states that joined the Eurozone. There's one more that joined since this map, and that's tiny little Estonia. Not very easy to see. Um, but this is a subset of countries in the EU. And as you all know, when the financial crisis hit, emanating from the US, it eventually hit Europe, it hit the banking sector, it hit state finance. And all of a sudden, all of these countries that had joined in a common currency had joined a common monetary policy without having a common fiscal policy. This caused a number of, of issues. What's very interesting about the Euro crisis from the standpoint of what I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, which is the Hungarian problem, is that this was actually an area where the European Union acted really quickly. Because this was an issue in which the problem was member states' budgets, and member states' budgets were not already an issue that was clearly in the jurisdiction of uh, European Union law or of the European uh, Commission, this had to come from the Council, right? So any area that's not already tasked to the Commission has to go to the Council for action, right? You, you see how the, the logic works. And the Council, led by Germany, was really active. So they passed a series of major, major renovations in EU law. They had a thing called the six pack, the two pack, the fiscal compact. It's a huge, I mean, in fact, it, it's, it's taken many of us full time to just figure out what they did in a few years to basically give the European uh, Commission the ability to oversee the budgets of all the member states. This was a totally new 
competency uh, that hadn't existed at the commission before, but because the council really felt it could see that this was a crisis, it could act, it could give these responsibilities to the commission. So it is possible for the EU to act quickly. But what happens when you have a problem in a single member state? And now this is where I'm going to pivot to the Hungarian part of this because every once in a while, actually right now you've got this particular problem in one member state, you've got an issue where the, the European Union has to act not on behalf of, in some sense, a lot of states that are in trouble at once, but just one. The financial crisis, which led to the, to the Eurozone crisis, actually hit Hungary earlier and faster than any other member state. Um, if you, this is the, a little chart that shows the percent GDP change year to year, and so the country was ticking along at a pretty good growth rate, and then suddenly the bottom fell out of the universe. Um, but if you look at the timing, actually Hungary's fiscal crisis started in earnest in 2006 which was a bit in advance of the global financial crisis, which really started hitting in a big way later, 2008, 2009. So Hungary was actually the first country to really go through um, a major financial crisis, even before the rest of Europe. It was about six months to a year ahead of the rest of Europe. And as a result, it was the first country in the EU to get a bailout, and this generated a question. I mean, it wasn't in the Eurozone, which was why it didn't immediately trigger a Eurozone-type crisis. It had its own currency. But there was still an issue. No EU country had ever been bailed out. How do you do a bailout? So there was an improvised solution in which the International Monetary Fund, which had given Hungary loans in the 90s to get it through its, its post-communist transition, the IMF was brought in and was required to work with the, um, the European Central Bank and the European Commission to establish a kind of fiscal program for Hungary. Um, unfortunately for the government of Hungary, it came about at the end of a rocky term of office for the government that was then in power. And all of this happened right before the, the austerity program that came with the IMF bailout went into effect right before a Hungarian election. And what happened in the election? Well, this is a little map of the Hungarian Parliament. The, uh, actually, there it's red. So the red seats <laughs> reflect the seats won in the, Euro in, in the Hungarian parliament by one political party. It's called Fidesz. Uh, its leader is a, is a guy called Viktor Orban, who founded the party in 1988. He's been the leader of it ever since. Um, it wasn't that the government got, that the, that the party that got all those seats got 66% of the vote. They got 68% of the seats. They had 52% of the vote and Hungary had a disproportionate election system that boosted the 52% of the vote to the 68% of the seats. Um, the, the, government, the party which had been in government before, it's actually this so interesting, the colors up there are so different than the colors on my screen here, but you can see that there's a, if I move, oops, oh, that wasn't what I meant to do. Let's try it on again. Ah, what did I do? There, okay, got it, okay. So let me try to work the pointer here. Does it work? Well, I don't know doesn't quite work. Okay. Anyway, there are some red seats. If you can see, it's, it's, there's uh, shades from orange into red. Those were the seats of the party that had previously been the government <laughs> right before. So they lost hugely. The dark green seats there are a far-right, almost neo-Nazi party called Jobbik. And the, the green seats were a small, independent kind of green party that entered the parliament for the first time. The crucial thing about this was that the, the election was a reaction to the disastrous management of the prior government, but it was also, I think, a reaction to the financial crisis. I mean, no state that had ever seen that kind of collapse could really get through an election without, lose, without that government losing. But there was a problem in Hungary, and the problem was that the disproportionate election law in this kind of perfect storm election produce this constitutional supermajority in the parliament. What do I mean by a constitutional supermajority? The constitution of Hungary could be changed with a single two-thirds vote of the parliament. It's a unicameral parliament. There's no independently elected president. There's no upper house. Basically, things can slide right through the parliament to the prime minister that, that, that is the head of the party that now dominates the parliament. And suddenly, we're uh, off to the races. <laughs> okay. So this is the 
precursor of basically a constitutional revolution. Um, one of the problems, since I've just described to you who the players are in the parliament, is that Mr. Orban, who's here on the left, um, basically had about half the public supported him. Um, a little over a quarter supported the left or liberals at the upper right-hand corner. There were a number of demonstrations with signs in English like that, like we're, we're part of Europe. Um, but there was another, you know, 20 percent of the public that supported this far-right party. And any of you who know, for example, Germany in the 20s and 30s will know that it's a really dangerous combination when you get a government in power and its opposition is divided between left and right. In other words, there was no way for those two parties to ever get together on anything and oppose this government. So it essentially had no ability, the opposition had no ability to control what this government was doing. And of course, with the two-thirds amendment rule, what it meant was that they could do anything. And so they did. <laughs> so what do they do? They rewrite the entire Constitution with only their own party. In fact, the first time any of us saw it was when it appeared full-blown out of the heads of, well, who knows? We still don't know actually who wrote it. Um, it appeared full-blown in the parliament. It sort of sat there for a month while everyone was trying to figure out what it said. They passed it with just the votes of their own party, didn't take into account any con you know, conversation, amendments, suggestions from the opposition, and it was their own constitution. <laughs> they didn't stop there. In their four years in power, the first four years in power, they passed more than 800 laws. They revised the criminal code, the civil code, the land law, that just virtually everything, all the election law. They rewrote more or less the entire legal system of the country with only the votes of their own party. I mean, literally, with the exception of the far-right party that liked some of the things they did, there, were, there was no support um, elsewhere for their policy. So imagine if you have one party that can do anything. So isn't there somebody who can stop them? Well, they disabled <laughs> all of the institutions that could stop them. It turns out that after 1989, the main check on the power of this unicameral parliamentary government was a constitutional court. A constitutional court that had really extraordinary powers to review virtually every law for constitutionality. This had become one of the most active courts in the country. In fact, the reason why I specialize in Hungary is that I went to study that court in the 1990s when they were almost running the government. I mean, you can imagine if all the checking power is in this one body, it has a lot of power. So when Fidesz came to power, they changed the system for electing judges. They expanded the number of judges. Think what would happen at like Roosevelt's court packing plan, but you know, in this kind of a context. They expanded the number of judges, and within three years, they'd gotten a majority on the court. They also cut the jurisdiction so that not all rights can even be reviewed. Violations of rights can even be reviewed by this court. So this was the main check on the system, and now it's essentially dead. Um, they also proceeded to go after the independent judiciary, which had quite a, by this time, reasonably good reputation. They did that through a very clever move. They suddenly lowered the judicial retirement age from 70 to 62. It's a civil service judiciary. That knocks out you know, 20%, almost 25% of the Supreme Court, most of the court presidents, it knocks out the entire leadership of the judiciary. And then they created this office which had a political appointee at the head of it, actually the wife of the guy who drafted the Constitution. And she named all the new judges into all the leadership positions in the judiciary. Um, the mass media, so it turns out the media are all being bought up by oligarchs close to the governing party. They put into effect a media council that has to review all media for compliance with a bunch of standards, one of which is that anyone who broadcasts news, any outlet that broadcasts or prints news, has to engage in balanced coverage. Who's on the media council? Only people associated with the governing party. After 89, Hungary, which had been, shall we say, somewhat centralized in the communist period, had decentralized a lot of functions. Schools went to local, uh, were controlled by local governments, health care. A number of powers were devolved to prevent this kind of centralization. The new constitution re-centralized everything. And then the government went one by one through all the independent checking authorities, the election commission, the prosecutor's office, the data protection authority, the central bank, the state audit office, every single office that was basically inhabited by professionals, and they put in all their own people. 
By the, by the end of the first two years, actually, there was no institution that was either independent or in the hands of the opposition because they could do all of this with no check. They similarly had some interesting economic ideas. So because the, the, the IMF Troika, the ECB Commission IMF loan, had been so unpopular and the austerity conditions so onerous, they announced from the beginning that they were no longer going to take any IMF money. So then the question was, how are they going to get money? So they engaged in a series of rather unusual economic policies. So it turns out when in Hungary, for better or for worse, whenever you left state sector jobs, you got a leaving bonus, a certain pot of money that was connected to your salary. Uh, and that was, I think, to make up for the fact that public sector salaries were not so generous. But of course, when you are new into government, who are all the people who were leaving the government last time? They're all the people you're replacing. They taxed all the leaving bonuses at 95%. <laughs> they then put taxes retroactively, right? So if you had spent that money, you were in trouble. They then put really large, what they called crisis taxes on all the sectors of the economy where foreign corporations were dominant. And they put a transaction tax on every time any money moved in and out of the national currency. And the foreign is used only in one small country, so there's a lot of transactions. Every time you pay a 2.7% tax, if you go to Hungary now, you'll see this on all of your bills. Um, and then they decided to just, they, they still had budget holes to plug if they're not getting the IMF money, so what do they do? They nationalize private pensions. Just take all the money, use it to plug budget holes. Then after that ran out, they, when they had to try to pay off some other loans, they nationalized the rural savings and loans and used the money in the deposit accounts to pay, to again, plug budget holes. Quite something. Um, at the same time that all of this is happening, of course, the far right, which had done quite well in the 2010 election, was actually being fanned in some ways by this governing party. Uh, what you see on the left is, the, is one of the campaign posters from 2010. I always like to use that poster because the woman in the middle used to be one of my closest friends. She was not a neo-Nazi at the time. Uh, in fact, her whole career before she became one of the founders of the neo-Nazi party was in human rights organizations ask me in the question period, but um, so a lot of the people who wound up in these new parties were not people you would expect. Um, this organization has been working with these paramilitary organizations that terrorized Roma villages that uh, one of the members of this party in the parliament had called for the government to make a list of all Jews in the country and their addresses so that, that this party could assess the security risk. This is really, when I say neo-Nazi, I'm not just trying to be hysterical here. This is really a, a far-right party. But the Fidesz, the governing party, took the 10 items on the Jobbik party platform from 2010. There were 10 things the party promised. And Fidesz did all of them. So the separation between the governing party and the far-right was not very big. In fact, if anything, the governing party was trying to steal far-right voters. And so, how did they get away with all of this? Well, one of the things they did, because they were continually operating under this budget crisis, was they engaged in what I call targeted austerity. And actually, I'm really surprised that more countries that have had to deal with these radical austerity programs have not done more of this. They basically aimed the austerity programs at the political opposition. They fired everybody from the state sector who was affiliated with the opposition, or at least everybody that they could figure out. Um, they actually made sure that no state contracts went to anybody who was affiliated with the political opposition. They made sure that people felt like their employment was insecure if they were affiliated with the political opposition. And by the political opposition here, I mean the, the political opposition of the left. They're trying to co-opt the right and also marginalize the left. Okay? And one of the ways they saved a lot of money was by defunding everything the left cared about, anything that would go to NGOs, to any organization that might support or bulk up um, the left. And then, and this was actually from a speech uh, just a little over, maybe it was less than two weeks ago, um, there was a Hungarian election again last, on Sunday the 6th of April. This is the day before the election at the last rally where the prime minister appeared. There's this guy who looks very, you know, sort of stereotypically Hungarian with a big mustache. He's an actor. And he stood up at this rally where the prime minister was present and read a poem by a nationalist poet. And some of the lines of this poem are really quite extraordinary. May they treat you the way you voted. This is the day before election day. May they save you from your burning house the way that you voted. 
Does that mean the fire department's not going to show up if your house burned, if you vote for somebody else? May they pull you from the flooding waters the way you voted. May you get bred when close to death by starving the way you voted. This is at the rally where the prime minister appears the day before the election 10 days ago. Okay? This has been a situation in which if you are against the governing party, <laughs> you really do that at your own peril. Okay? So what happens in the election? This is a different map of the election. <laughs> Fidesz, the governing party, looks like it sweeps the election. I'm sorry, this is in Hungarian. I didn't have a chance to translate the graphic. But the top part tells you the percentage of seats in the parliament won by the governing party. And it is just barely enough, 66% for their two-thirds. Um, the main opposition party, which is the red, there got about um, only 19% of the seats. They got 26% of the vote, but 19% of the seats. Fidesz got 66% of the seats with over, and the, and the vote totals only 45% of the vote. Again, this disproportionate election system, but they played with it in the last four years. They could never have gotten their two-thirds majority with the old system, actually. Disproportionate though it was, they needed a lot of tricks to win this election. And what's interesting, I think, is the contrast between the chart at the top, which shows you what the new parliament looks like. Fidesz has got another four years with two-thirds. And you look at the chart at the bottom, which is how people voted. The white bloc, 38, almost 39 percent, didn't vote, which is an unusually high um, you know, non-turnout in Hungary. I think a lot of people are just staying away from politics. Fidesz was actually voted for, if you consider also the non-voters, only by 27 percent of the public and they have their two-thirds back again. So we're going to have to deal with them for another four years. And so let me come back around to my little EU lesson at the beginning. All of this is happening in the European Union, right? which we've seen can act in a crisis, because they acted with the Eurozone crisis. They were able to pull themselves together. Um, they, this is happening in the middle of a European Union, which claims to be supporting the values in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. This is happening in a European Union which has been able to grow and expand and expand its competencies and, and to be something, right? People think, how can this happen in the EU? And what I want to just talk about for a few minutes next is just, so what did the EU do? <laughs> what can it do? And the answer, I'm afraid, is that their options are actually really limited. In the EU, there is no way to throw a country out. The treaties don't include this possibility. There is a way a country can quit, <laughs> but Hungary is right now getting almost all of its internal, um, I mean, all the foreign mo money that is sort of coming in to do anything in Hungary is coming from the EU. Most foreign investors have fled at this point. So they're not going to quit. They're getting money. Can the EU cut this money? Not really. <laughs> there is no procedure to do it. Right now, the most serious sanction that the EU can engage in is to invoke what's called Article 7 of the Treaty of the European Union. And if that is invoked, what it means is that Hungary would lose its right to vote in the Council. Okay, remember, there's the Commission, the Council. The Council is where the states act as states. You lose your right to vote in the Council if they decide to invoke this option. But so far, this option has been really unthinkable. So you must think, well, you know, the EU is such a big, big thing. Like, it's got to be able to enforce its values, right? And so what about human rights, right? Doesn't the, you know, the EU stands for human rights? And the answer is the EU doesn't do rights, actually. Um, it actually doesn't have this in its core law, at least not as applied to the member states. With the Lisbon Treaty, they got something called the Charter of Fundamental Rights. It only applies to actions by the EU, not actions by the member states. So if there are human rights violations in the member states, what they have to, they, they get addressed through a system that's not an EU system at all. It's another council, Council of Europe, which includes all those states that are in colors, uh, not Belarus, but all the rest, um, they're in color. Um, from Greenland to Vladivostok, the Council of Europe and the Convention on Human Rights covers this whole territory. So you think, well, that's OK. That ought to work. The problem is that the European Court of Human Rights, because it's one court, that gets cases from such a big area is completely flooded with cases. 
the backlog is just enormous. And so cases are incredibly, incredibly slow. And so in four years of, of this revolution that I've described to you, so far the European Court of Human Rights has only gotten really around to deciding on two cases that come out of this. So one was that, that retroactive tax that I mentioned to you before, the 98% retroactive tax. They held that was a violation of the right to property and fair procedure. But they decided that in 2013 when the tax went into effect in 2010. That's still very fast for that court. Um, and then just a few weeks ago, they decided in a case that involved this uh, guy who's pictured here, Mr. Ivani, who's a schismatic Methodist minister. Among the many things that this government did, and I've only just scratched the surface, they took 250 registered churches and religious organizations in Hungary and suddenly said overnight, you no longer count as religious organizations. You lose your tax exemption, you lose whatever subsidies you got from the state budget, you lose everything, and now you have to reapply. 32 of those churches, uh, they, uh, they include three Jewish organizations. At the, at the time, in the initial batch, it included no Muslim organizations or Buddhist. Or, but 32 were then approved. Mr. Ivani was not one of them. Turns out Mr. Ivani is somebody who has a one-man anti-poverty program. He has a congregation that mostly deals with Roma and very poor people. And he has a soup kitchen, and he's constantly trying to help people. The government finds this really awful. And I think in many ways, the church's law was aimed at him. So now he's won, actually, his case at the European Court of Human Rights, the violation of his freedom of religion and association, for the government to suddenly say, you're no longer a church. You can't operate as such. But what does he get? Well, the problem in the Council of Europe system is that there aren't really big sanctions. You know, the most that anybody gets is the government pays you some money if you win. And Mr. Ivani is someone who's taken a vow of poverty. He's not so interested in that. He asked for nothing. And so the court gave him his, quote, just satisfaction. But the court can't order the government to recognize him. And this is true in general with the Court of Human Rights judgments. If you have a government that really decides not to follow it, not to follow the decisions, they don't really have to. There are lots of other human rights violations that may come before this court or may not, but so far we haven't seen them. One other thing that Hungary did is being home, if you're homeless, it's now a crime. You can be fined. Actually, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights actually pulled out of the Hungarian government that I think it's the only government that's turned the homeless into a profit center. They made $125,000 US um, last year out of fines on the homeless. Um, they've also found a way to, to abolish all of their programs that actually uh, support people who are poor. In general, you have to work on sort of government chain gangs um, to get paid anything. Um, the government also created this new anti-terrorism police that actually reports directly to the prime minister, has very few legal controls on its power. So far, no cases at the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and then discrimination is on the rise. Um, what it, on the left is a kind of bad picture, actually, of a monument that's not yet built but is under construction. The government of Hungary, like I said, has been playing under the table with far-right groups. One of the things they're engaged in is tr trying to rewrite the history of Hungarian complicity in the Holocaust. This is a memorial that um, was, not was, was not supposed to be built yet um, that actually portrays uh, the victims of the German occupation of 1944-45 in which Hungarians are portrayed as victims along with the Jews that Hungarian police sent to Auschwitz all in one monument. Um, and then on Roma issues, the government has been claiming that it's engaged in this whole process of, uh, engage, uh, of, um, of including Roma after a, after a court of human rights decision which found that Hungary's segregated schools were a violation of the convention. That was brought under a previous um, government. Now the new government has got segregated schools that they claim are affirmative action. Um, in any event, there's a whole series of things that could count as human rights violations, but it's going to take a very long time to get through the system, and at the end, there'll be a very tiny remedy. So what else? Well, you know, the EU should be able to enforce the rule of law. And actually, the European Commission was very good this morning. They actually gave us some news. This morning, I woke up to discover that the European Commission had brought three what are called infringement procedures, something the Commission can do. If you're a member of the EU and you're violating EU law, the, the European Commission can take you to court, can take you, take you, the country, to the European Court of Justice and make sure that you follow EU law, rule of law. Well, as I said to you before, and this is why we needed the civics lesson at the beginning, all this EU law, the vast majority of EU law, is on the common market. 
it's not on all this other stuff. All that second and third pillar of security, freedom, justice, home affairs, all that stuff is a work in progress, and there's not much law there. All the law is on this first pillar stuff. So of all the things I've just told you Hungary does, what does the commission pick out? This morning they decide to go after Hungary for antitrust violations in the farm sector, excise duties on spirits, and tobacco sales. Because that's where the law is. They're trying. I mean, I know they're trying, but that's all they've got. It's basically still the market. Um, they did bring, the commission did bring, two cases against Hungary that have more political implications. So when the judicial retirement age was lowered, the commission sprung into action. We can enforce EU law with this, we said. And so they charged Hungary before the European Court of Justice with age discrimination. Okay, now the problem was the takeover of the judiciary, right? But that wasn't something they thought was in EU law. You know, I mean, yes, they rely on every state having a judiciary that's independent, but can they really make that a legal question at the Court of Justice? Not so clear. Okay? So they brought this case for age discrimination. They expedited it because the judges were being fired at that time. The ECJ, you know, went right into action, came out with this adverse judgment found against Hungary. But because it was a discrimination case, Hungary did the minimum it had to do. It paid compensation to all the judges, and very few of them went back to their jobs. Very aggressive action did nothing. Similarly, there was a moment when the Hungarian government fired the old data privacy officer. The European Union requires every country to have one. Hungary had fired its data privacy officer when the data privacy officer discovered that questionnaires the government sent out saying, these are anonymous questionnaires, send us back your opinion. All the questionnaires had barcodes that allowed the government to see the name and address of all the people who sent back the questionnaires because they were trying to figure out who was with them and who's not, right? So the data privacy officer who brought that up was fired and they replaced him with somebody from the government. And so the commission, because the data privacy office required by EU law, brings this action. The Court of Justice last week came out with a decision saying it's a violation of EU law. What happens? Are they really going to be able to bring back the old data privacy commissioner after three years? What would be, I mean, you can see the problem, that these are decisions that are so little, so late, and the government might pay a fine, but they still run everything. So what else can the commission do? Well, I, I mentioned to you that, of course, Hungary and, and all the poorer states of the European Union get huge amounts of funds from the EU for all kinds of things. I mean, there's a, this is really a net benefit to them. You'd think they could cut the funds. Well, there's no provision in the treaties that allows fund cuts for bad behavior. Okay? Instead, you can cut somebody's funds if they run a persistent deficit. This is left over from the Euro crisis. One of the things that was put in place are sanctioning mechanisms of countries run big deficits. So the commission tries to do this. Hungary's got a big deficit. We're going to put them in what's called the excessive deficit procedure and threaten to cut their funds. So this is when Mr. Orban decides to nationalize the private pensions and just pay off the debt, gets out from under it. What can the EU say? Does a country have to have private pension funds according to EU law? It's a democratically, you know, so you see the problem, they tried. They also tried to freeze what's called the cohesion funds. Cohesion funds are funds that go to big construction projects. And they tried, they really tried to get, you know, this was something where there were huge infrastructural projects and development in Hungary. This was a lot of money that was coming into the budget. They froze all of these, I think for bad behavior, but they can't say that. They instead relied on the fact that, that Hungary put in this little requirement that every engineer who works on an EU project has to be a member of the National Association of Hungarian Engineers. And they said that's, you know, that's against the services provision of the common market that you can't have an engineer have to belong to a national association to get a contract under EU funds. All right, you see that what the problem is. So what happened? Hungary just removed the requirement, got all the cohesion funds back because there was no other way to cut funds. I want to say here, by the way, the commission's really trying. They're being very creative. This is more aggressive than they've ever been, and yet it's not enough. So what about the European Parliament? Well, European Parliament now has some powers, and, the, and they use them. They can develop what's called an own initiative report. And they can just generate an agenda item, and they basically did. So the Civil Liberties Committee of the European Parliament drafted this report. Marie Tavares, who's here on the screen, uh, was the chief rapporteur. And last August, I mean last uh, July, 
the European Parliament passed with a quite overwhelming, I'm sorry, not 14, 13, sorry. <laughs> it was, it hasn't happened yet, 13. I just have a mistake, thank you. Um, passed this quite remarkable report that chapter and verse went through all of these ways that Hungary had done scary and worrisome things, but the European Parliament doesn't have the power to sanction. So they said, what do they do? They said, okay, so the commission, the council, the two executives, and we, we will all watch them closely. Then they said to the commission, and you've got to do with, you have to use with Hungary what they call an Article II alarm agenda. What's that? It means every time the commission deals with Hungary on anything, which is all the time, they've got to raise Article II issues. They can't deal with anything until they deal with the values questions. They're telling another institution to do something. Does the other institution have to do it? Not really, according to EU law. Um, they proposed something called a Copenhagen Commission. They picked up this proposal from uh, my colleague and former institute member, Jan Werner Mueller, which is to have a kind of monitoring body that provides early warning signals in case this happens. And eventually they said we should think about removing Hungary's vote in the council. But they don't really have the power to do any of these things. Okay, this is the most they can do. But here's the problem. The other executive of the European Union has done nothing. And the way that Europe acts is they're all kind of yoked together. The council, remember, is the one that has all the member states. And every member state has a reason, not everyone, but there are enough member states that have reasons not to do anything that this has been the problem. It's the reason why I had to give you the civics lesson because they're all now connected. You need the council to approve anything new that the EU will do. Why is the council not acting? Well, the council's not acting because there are a number of member states who say, well, if they go after Hungary for this thing, we do that one thing. If they go after Hungary for that one thing, we do that one thing. It's been impossible for them to see that there's a sum total of things here that is not what anybody else is doing. But as long as the council doesn't act, They've done, the Parliament's done everything it can, the court has done all it can, the Commission has done all it can. These are all the powers there are. They've all been used, and so far, nothing. Now, um, this is to say that the Institute's been responsible for two of the main proposals that are on the table for new powers. Uh, Jan Mueller, my colleague at Princeton, who was here as a member last year, has proposed this Copenhagen Commission. The idea is to create a new body whose job it is to assess whether member states are actually in violation of of the values of Article II of the treaties. The problem is that this is going to require treaty change, as they say, and treaty change requires unanimity. You can't create a new body unless every member state votes for it. And you can imagine there's at least one member state that won't want to vote for this. So right now that proposal's on hold, although the European Parliament's gotten behind it. What I've been proposing and what I've been doing in part while I've been here this year is to say, well, look, let's try to work with these legal remedies these infringement procedures that the Commission can bring. And I've been trying to, and I've presented this at the Commission, and they're actually really now quite on board, I think, with this. Um, is to, instead of just saying judicial retirement age, just data privacy officer, group them together. Put a whole bunch of small violations together into a package and say the set of violations rises to the level of violating a value in Article 2. So this is, a, this is the proposal that I've been putting on the table. It's making its way through the system. The commission came out with a new thing just a, a month or so ago, saying we have this rule of law problem <laughs> in the EU, and so here is a new framework. And basically what the commission has now done is to put on the table a set of steps that the, that the uh, other uh, institutions would have to follow in order to be able to use the sanction of Article 7, which is this removing the, the uh, Hungary's vote, which has so far been considered something you couldn't do. And this is Article 7. I won't go through all of it. It's just to say that even if they get to the point of raising Article 7, there are so many supermajority requirements. You have to have two-thirds of the parliament. You need three-quarters of the council. You need such a vote that it's sort of hard to imagine that it could be used. Okay, but this is what they're now trying to make a path to use. And if you can actually invoke Article 7, all you get is the removal of Hungary's vote in the Council. So can Europe address the moral challenge? This is a little map of Hungary. <laughs> After last week's election, this shows you all the districts won by Fidesz and the ones in the other color are the ones won by the, the, by the left opposition. 
this is the result of the new disproportionate election law that Fidesz put in place. They've won. They have four more years in power, and the EU is still struggling to find tools. So what I want to leave you with is a sense that it's not that the EU's done nothing. The EU has done everything it can. The problem is that that's all the EU can do so far, given the state of things, given the, the jerry-rigged way it's gone together, given the, reason, given the kind of institutional structures I've explained. This is all the power the EU has. And so, unfortunately, Hungary is continuing more or less without really being sanctioned. And I'm afraid that's my depressing conclusion. But thank you for listening.